Coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri. It's the Faster Freedom Show. With your hosts, Sam Prim and Lucas Wall. We're talking about freedom. Hi, Lucas. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? You're not Lucas. You're Matthew. I'm not Lucas. I'm Matthew. I'm Steve. I am whatever you want me to be. You're Marty, Matthew, Steve, Dubs, Bubs, all the things. So Matt has been a guest host before. He is the COO, Chief Operating Officer of our um, Faster Freedom education brand. So welcome again. You did a great job last time. So we're going to have you back. What's up, Ginger? If you're watching, um, let us know where you're from and go ahead and say hi. We would appreciate that very much. Throw some comments in the chat box. We're just going to get right into my rant, Matthew. What do do you think? I want your answer. Then I'll rant. Do you think vulnerability is a strength or a weakness? I think it is now a strength. I think uh, in years past, it was not. It was something that people shied away from. We are reading the book, Dare to Lead, by Brene Brown, and the first chapter is about vulnerability. Um, It's a a thing that we do on our leadership team, and actually all of our companies, we read a book, and every single week at the meeting, we talk about kind of like a book club. Uh, We'd read, you know, we've read Good to Great by Jim Collins. We Starts with Why. Starts with Why. um, The One Thing by Gary Keller. So we read like you know operational or like business minded books and this one we are uh old kansas nice we got we got ginger in kansas um so what uh what we got going on here is vulnerability is strength or weakness Brene talks about it in the first chapter of her book so it came to mind and i had a twitter conversation last year with somebody i just asked is strength a vulnerability or weakness and most people said strength a few people said weakness and this gentleman um was very macho like you can't let people know that you're feeling anything you can't be weak you have to be like a stone wall in front of people so they don't take advantage of you and that kind of mindset yeah so you think it's a strength why do you think it's a strength Matthew? i do so going back to your your macho man rainy savage uh experience so obviously yeah probably days of the past uh you know big strong leaders uh in companies but um i'll kind of kick back a question to you but like uh is every leader proficient in every aspect of leadership or skill set? And the answer is Lucas is the only one. <laughs> Lucas is Lucas is up there though. <laughs> Lucas is up there. But the question is, <clears throat> is you know being vulnerable a strength? And and a hundred percent it is. Like you have uh, a skill set or you know an aptitude for leading a team, but you are not proficient in every aspect of leading a team. So what what can you rely on to do that? And it's people right so Mm -hmm. how do you get people to be their best selves and it's being vulnerable it's being transparent it's communicating it's having you know reasons and whys and 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 facts about like just next steps in the company and and struggles and challenges and obstacles so i believe it is um but love to hear your thoughts and let us know what you think in the in the chat box if you think that a vulnerability is a strength or a weakness so i'm definitely going with strength for sure i feel like we are starting a movement here, um, not just us, but in general, are like age people, you know, like mid 30s, people that are starting to get in the business world and start companies that are creating impact. You know, there's not many 20 year olds that have companies that are big enough to create impact, you know. So I feel like mid 30s is kind of when, you know, um, gentlemen and women and people in the business space start to create businesses or get into leadership positions at businesses where they're able to make an impact. So I feel like we're just starting this movement that vulnerability is okay. Yeah, it's a good thing. It creates connections and connections create results, right? If you feel comfortable bringing up something that somebody did that made you feel uncomfortable or you feel comfortable bringing up something to your boss that you think could improve what the overall company's doing, I think that is huge having, you know, that be something that having that open environment and you're not going to have an open environment unless there's some vulnerability there. I feel like this goes back to uh, something that we've experienced recently. Uh, we're in a couple masterminds, right? Uh, we are. Uh, the family mastermind, great mastermind, collective genius, great mastermind. Both of them have a good chunk of people, I don't know what the 50-ish or higher boomers, I guess, or the younger boomers yeah. maybe. Um, and then like that. millennials, there's like the, this two separate kind of groups of people getting along great, but kind of colliding in these groups. And I see this from all the old heads. Um, They're all, you know, like back in the day, everything was this way and that way. And I can't get any young people to work for me. And anybody anybody hear that? Like, oh, these millennials, these Gen Zs, they don't want to work. These alphas, is that the new one? Um, (laughs) These these people don't want to work. And my response is they don't want to work for you. 
Yeah. Because you're a shitty leader. Uh, you have this old school mindset that this is the only way to do things. You used to be able to smoke on airplanes when we were both born in the age. You could smoke on airplanes. You don't think that like things <laughs> improve, Progress, right? Yeah, and like, have you seen Mad Men? I have. That's not the best work environment. Having the sexism and all that stuff. That so culturally, society is improving and changing and growing. And being vulnerable as, as a leader, I think, is part of that. And we're on the front lines of that. Yeah. We have young kiddos that work for us, and they work their butts off because we lead with uh, strength, but also vulnerability at the same time. It's not my way or the highway. That way of thinking uh, is in the past, and it's, I, I'm glad it's in the past. And I think as society evolves, um, these type of things happen. You need more collaboration than just demanding. You need more, I mean, I think like 100 years ago, women couldn't even vote. Like you don't think society is progressing in the right direction, and I think this is just part of it. Yeah, yeah, not, I mean, I think uh, I think it's a two-way street, right? So, like, it needs to be a, a tactful approach from each party. So, obviously, leadership, and then you have some sort of supporting role within the business. But it needs to be a tactful approach and communication. Like, I think if uh, this open door policy, like, if you if you have this open door policy, like, you, there needs to be respect, there needs to be like order, but there also needs to be like the ability to listen. Mm -hmm. I think listening is the biggest component from like a leadership standpoint. Are that, you telling that to me? Is that I what mean, you're, are you, are you talking mean, to me specifically about I mean, not listening no, to you? No, we collaborate well, and I think that's what, you know, makes this thing work the way it does. So thanks, Sam. Thank you. I'm just listening. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's a two-way street for sure. I think, uh, I think leaders need to be open to feedback, open to ideas, but also, um, you know, individuals within the company that have these ideas need to approach it in the appropriate way. It can't be like, we need to do this. It needs to be like, hey, I have an idea. This is the idea. Here's the supporting evidence, like bring evidence that supports your idea. Don't just, you know, throw something out of left field. Kiki. Okay. But um, no, and, and we, we do an awesome job here, I think. And you talked about like age, right? Like I think our, like median age here is like low twenties, mm -hmm. uh, which is awesome. But it's like we have young people in this office that are driven and motivated to like grind and do awesome work, and like we see it day in and day out. Yeah, I think pretty much everybody but Shane at our office is really hardworking young young cats. You know what I mean? <laughs> just Shane's kidding. Right Shane here. works really hard. Just a joke. So yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I, I think that I do get the mindset of being strong and, and like having a strong front, but you can be strong and vulnerable at the same time. They're not like opposites. And in fact, I think they're synonyms, potentially. Vulnerability, strength, they all kind of tie together and they all are is what required to lead the right way. I feel like the newer version of leading is the leader in the front taking the arrows, taking the um, feedback, taking the constructive criticism, you know, kind of leading the way. And the old school way is kind of like in the back, letting everybody else drag you and you just kind of sit there and, and, and the Santa, the Santa way versus the Rudolph way. We're the Rudolph Ooh, way. There you go. Nose shining so bright. What about hashtag? Let's write a book called leading from the middle. Ooh, arm in arm. Oh, you the, write that book. I'm going to call, okay. I'm called, I'm going to do the Rudolph leadership style. Okay. We'll Red see nose. Who sells more. Probably you. <laughs> um, I'm not good at selling books. I do have a book, Own Your Freedom. Go check it out. Four ninety nine on Amazon. Comes with a free video course too. Is well worth five bucks. I promise. So, in general, I think we agree. I get that um, no exact style is perfect. I don't like people that speak in absolutes. Anybody that follows any of my stuff knows that. That that's one of my few pet peeves is people that think their way is the only way. Talking to you, Dave. You little shit. Just kidding. I was trying to get you to spit when you were drinking. No. Anyways, Dave. It's fine guy. <laughs> um, awesome. So, yeah, that was kind of our opening rant. What we got next is we got REI School. Uh, we're going to talk about the 2024 real estate market. If you're watching, you can see the outline on the screen. And if you're listening to the podcast after, we love you. Thank you. Do this. Put us on your list twice a week, um, 60 to 90 minutes. But also we do. We are on, on YouTube Live, and you can check out the YouTube recordings after, and the show is cut up on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, thank you. If you're listening after, thank you. But we got the opening rant. I just kind of got over that vulnerability is a strength, in my opinion. And then we're going to talk about REI School for 20, 25 minutes. Me and you are going to break down the real estate market, and you're going to give people data-driven decisions based on your opinions <laughs> and experience in real estate. I found out that I was co-hosting 20 minutes ago, so I'm ready. You found out about an hour ago, I'm Matthew. Ready. Um, so we're going to talk about the real estate market. I got some simple charts I want to show you all. I want to talk through, you know, um, just some some simple data points. Like we're talking supply demand. We're talking interest rates. We're talking house prices. I'm not going to manipulate, you know 
what is it called when you like do Excel spreadsheets and there's like uh, pivot tables or something or I don't know, if then formulas. We're not doing any of that. We're just showing you simple data. So many people have been predicting a crash for, since I started 2015, there's been crash predictions every single year by big names. (laughs) Meet Kevin. Clicks. (laughs) Yes, clickbait. And they use like algorithmic data. Like let's, we're just gonna show you simple data that is the actual numbers. And then we're gonna get into current headlines. We got some cool stuff talking about usually like we do, but a little bit of uh, AI, open AI stuff and, and some business stuff we're gonna get into. Then we're gonna riddle. I'm going to make you look stupid, okay. which is hard to do because you're a smart guy. Thank you. And then uh, true or false, you're going to make me look stupid, which is not that hard to do. <laughs> then we're going to get to a deal of the week, a seven pack of houses we're buying, and then we're going to motivate you on Motivation Wednesday. That is called a stacked and jacked and packed episode. I was going to say agenda, but let's rock it. Um, the whole episode. So are, are you okay? If the if you to do, you're going to do the uh, real estate school. I'm going to go ahead and get out of you're here. You're going to skedaddle. Uh, tee it off. Okay, I'm kidding. Yeah. I got this. All right, so let's talk about the 2024 real estate market. We're going to look at some simple charts and show you some simple things. Um, I think it's important. I always find it interesting when people that I know and respect at least a little bit, I feel like hopefully people on here are listening because they have some level of respect for us and our experience. Somebody that has more experience or just a lot of experience in a certain field, real estate especially, I love listening to their thoughts. And everybody's going to know. I don't even need to say it, but I will. Like, we're not, we don't know for sure, but we're just taking a little bit of a data driven and like a, a perspective ish approach to this. We're not, yeah. we're not freaking out. We're talking about the bigger picture here and looking at some simple numbers. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Okay. So um, let, let's kind of, I want to start this with uh, kind of the market landscape in 08 a little bit, because that's the really the only real estate crash that ever has happened um, in, in the history of of real estate really i mean uh the great depression was a a decent crash but like there's it's cyclical it's up and down it goes uh interest rates inflation a lot of things affect it but in general a crash and there's a couple different definitions for it i don't know that there is a real one i don't think webster's got involved in this yet <laughs> but a, a real estate crash is a 20 percent dip in house prices in in 12 months is kind of what's out there yeah and to be honest with you that didn't even happen in 08 in every market um, so in 08, um, from 2008 to 2011, St. Louis dropped about 15% in median house price values, which is a shit ton, but that's not 20% in one year. Some markets did see that, and some markets saw that in 2023 as well, end of 22, beginning of 23. So we do have cyclical real estate markets. Real estate markets kind of breathe, exhale, inhale. It's cyclical like most financial things. The biggest driver in that is supply versus demand. Yeah. Do you want to break that down? Yeah. I mean, supply pretty much. Uh, <laughs> any any industry and real estate's an industry. Supply. To, yeah. To supply yeah. So, so supply is the quantity of units. We'll call them units I that, love it. that's available um, in any market or any. Jake, any... Would, Jake would be proud. Jake. <laughs> okay. Right. I don't know. Closer Jake. Doesn't he call them units? He calls them units. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So anyway, available units at any given time. Um, demand is the amount of people that want those units. So mm-hmm. you have an increase in people wanting units, but the, the amount of units available is low. Um, obviously, it's going to drive something. And what does it drive? It typically drives price, right? Because price dictates um, the ability to obtain one of those units. So uh, if there's a huge demand, low amount of units, the price is going to go up. Uh, if there's a... a uh, a small did i say that right backwards forwards if there's a yeah so if there's a lot of units so there's a ton available yeah. and the demand is low yep. then price is yep. going to go because people want to move those units mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. So, so price is going to go down so pretty like high level thirty thousand foot view um just a simple formula yep. of if it's wanted and there's not a lot of it you're going to pay for it uh if it's not wanted and you have an abundance of that resource or asset um you're going to have to drop price to move it so no, I like it. I, you did a great job explaining. It. I kind of threw you under there, but you did a great job simply explaining it. So, in general, with a lot of things like, let's say, um, what are some big fads? Like uh, Beanie Babies were a fad for a while, and like that um, little smiley sponge thing was it like something that's not really. Um, yeah, like um, the Wii. Do you remember the Wii? The like, Wii video game. Yeah, it's like, like 
Yeah. So so things like that, the things that aren't necessary can get really affected by supply and demand. If the if the demand's super high, they can only produce so many of those, that's going to be like a frenzy. But the demand for that can go away. Beanie Babies aren't in yeah. big demand anymore, so the prices are nothing or they're not selling. That's not the case in real estate. Yeah, it's not a sustainable thing. Real right? estate, there's always a baked-in demand. There is always a baked-in demand. There's people that maybe it, it does fluctuate, but it never goes to zero. There's yeah. always people they have to move, they want to move, job relocations, people passing away, people growing their family, people downsizing. The world moves. The United States especially, we move a lot. So there's a baked-in demand with real estate. So supply is the big thing we want to look at. Demand will fluctuate, but it'll never be low or super low. It's always going to be a decent level, sometimes maybe higher. But the supply is the thing that we really need to look at in real estate. And let's pull up this supply demand chart, and I want to kind of show you um, what what happened in uh, in 2000. And oh, well, all right, um, that is yeah, okay. So that is kind of that shows supply and demand, and it should kind of shows some cyclicalness. I was gonna have the the website, but this works out. Um, so the supply and demand, if the in, in 2008 the supply was really, really high, which that chart doesn't show. So we can take that chart out. So in 2008, the supply was really, really high. Um, and the demand was was baked in as well, but the supply way surpassed the demand. And, and my definition of a crash is when people aren't willing to buy at the current prices. So the supply was crazy high in 08 because of you know people getting loans that they couldn't afford because a big thing that people don't talk about uh, the average first time home buyer is 33 years old. 2008 minus 33 years was when Roe versus Wade passed and there was a decline in, or a, a more of a decline in, in births. And people, first time home buyers, there weren't very many of them in 08. The supply was super high. People had loans they could not afford. And that's the reason for the crash. Right now, go back 33 years, there was actually an influx of people born 33 years ago so therefore the demand is even higher right now and then the supply is even lower the supply is some of the lowest it's ever been um so i think that that is just some general things to look at i just wanted to before we move on to like today's market i wanted to show and talk about the insane um you know difference in what the markets look like yeah yeah and really there quick. you go scroll there you go look at that so scroll down look at that I think it's down. There should be a, a chart down or up. Look at us. We're doing it live. Maybe it's maybe it's up. Uh, go up. Yeah, that's it's up. That's what I want to talk about. All right, so there you go. So um, you can see that the total housing inventory units. So if you're if you're watching, you can see. So the total ho housing inventory units um, is uh, uh, just for lack of um, you're not putting too many zeros on it. Uh, twenty two sixty five. So tw two thousand. Um, and uh, 2022, or where is it? 2000, uh, 20, 2,265 units. Um, right now, um, it is 860 units. And in 2007, it was 4,000 units. So let's simply put that there. In 2007, there was 4,000 units available. Right now, there's 800 units available. So that's a huge difference in supply and demand. And in 2008, there were more transactions than 2023. So we talked about this a little bit before. 2023 was the worst, as far as quantity goes, real estate year in like 75 years. Yeah. The prices just didn't drop because the demand was there and the supply was low. But the, as far as transactions, it was the, some insanely low amount. Yeah. Yeah, so, for sure. I don't know what your thoughts on that are, but. Yeah. I mean, how much, uh, I have a couple of thoughts kind of outside the box, but like how much does COVID play into that mm -hmm. obviously is that a factor but also going back to your uh you know roe v wade 33 years ago like also in today's age we're seeing more women in the workforce having you know children further on in their their career so like does that is that going to impact us down the line probably yes for sure because it has to do with it's just it's all it's all a math formula the issue why no one can really solve it and can predict is because a the variables change Nobody knew COVID was happening during election years. The uh, our economy is always artificially inflated because the current president, I don't care which party it is, wants to get reelected. So there's those factors that you can't really control. But there is stats and data that at least give us a baseline. And that's what we're looking at is the supply and demand because that drives every industry. 
every product, every anything, and that's what we're looking at right now, supply versus demand. So just wanted to get that out there. Real estate's not gonna go up every single year at the same pace forever. Real estate does go up every year. We'll talk about in, in aggregate. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But just wanted to bake in the supply demand, set that as a foundation, and show that um, and show that 08 is nothing like it is now. There's, I don't really know anything that is similar right now to was 08. Supply and demand is completely different. Um, the population is completely different. The loans that were given out are completely different. Um, so there's 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 no underlying causes to for a crash unless it's something. The only reason the only reason we'd see a crash or even a substantial dip is it would have to be reasons completely different than 08. Yeah, yeah, and you had that huge financial correction by the institutions given those loans. Obviously, that was you know a huge component to getting people into to properties that they simply couldn't afford and um just ninja like, loans no income no job yeah that was a thing i i know somebody that worked for mortgage institute he was not kidding he said he got handed his first day he sat on his desk he got handed like a big like playbook like or a big like um company like um handbook and uh and, and a little pack of white out so he could white out people's applications and fill out what <laughs> needed to be done that's not good so obviously that's going to lead to a crash those kind of things are yeah. we've, we've corrected those and people can afford the houses they're living at for the most part they have a ton of equity because house prices have gone up so much recently that um, people have equity and the equity gives them options to if they can't make their payments they can avoid pre-foreclosure or they can avoid foreclosure by selling because of equity or they can refinance or do something and, 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 you know, slow those payments down, even at today's higher interest rates, which aren't really that high. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. So that's the baseline so far. 08 and 2024 are nothing alike. Supply and demand drive the market. We good? Give me a thumbs up if we understand that so far. All right. Now, I think the next charts we got good because they're just charts. There's no scrolling. There's no website. There's no nothing. So the next charts are good. So let's pull up the um let's pull up the uh interest rate uh chart if you don't mind everybody so here is what i want to point out and if you're listening we'll explain it if you're watching you can see it but what i want to talk about this is the fed's funds rate now do you know the difference between the fed's funds rate and 30-year mortgage or do you want me to explain that um there's a there's not a baked in like increase is that accurate uh, to a certain degree. So the 30-year mortgage, it, they're, they're based on different things. So this is the Fed's funds rate. So I'll explain what this is not. This is not the rate you get on a 30-year mortgage. This is the rate that banks lend me money to buy rental properties, or a part of that rate. This is the rate that banks lend each other money at. The 30-year mortgage is markets-based. It's based on the 10-year treasury note. So it kind of mirrors that and, and, and kind of fluctuates with that. This, when Jerome Powell says, I'm lowering or raising rates, that has nothing to do with the 30 year mortgage. Yes, down the line through different like uh, funnels of like markets and, and availability of money and what banks are willing to do and how they need their books, it does affect it, but not when it comes to the actual rate. Jerome Powell drops the Fed funds rate a quarter of a point in July, let's say, which is probably my guess. That, that may have zero effect on the 30 year mortgage. Yeah. Okay. So this is the Fed's funds rate. So a couple of things that I noticed, Matthew, when I look at this chart, and if you're if you're just joining, the 30 year or the uh, the Fed's funds rate was around uh, 15 to 20 percent for a lot of the 80s. It was around uh, 12 uh, percent for a lot of the 70s, and just recently it was at zero percent after 08 and then after COVID, and it's back up to a little over five, like 5.3 percent, I think. So the the Fed's funds rates a little over five. Let's just say five to be safe. So what that means is the the a bank will borrow money from the federal government and pay the federal government five percent. They mark it up three or four percent, and that's why you and I, when we want to buy rental properties right now, we're getting an eight eight and a half percent mortgage because banks borrow at five percent. In 2020, banks were borrowing at 0%. So they gave us 3 or 4% loans. So does that make sense? Are yeah, we, okay. 100%. All right. So a couple of things I noticed is um, historically, would you say, just looking at that chart, Matt, what would you say the average? And I don't even know. I'll guess, too. The average Fed's funds rates, probably about where we're at. Yeah, maybe even a touch higher. I mean, obviously, you, you hear all the news and you hear all the, the doomsday people out there. But, like, if you if you look at it, like, in my opinion, those are like recency bias approaches, oh, yes. right? Like you've experienced the 3% rates, but like when you look at this chart in aggregate and you look at the big picture, like it seems like it's pretty okay to me. It is. It's been a lot higher before and it honestly hasn't been a lot lower before. It's been a lot lower a couple times, but overall it's been a, it's been a lot higher. And, and what, 
what the government does and what the Fed does, I guess, which I guess is kind of branch of the government. But what the Fed does is if um, we're in a recession, corporate earnings, um, stock market, everything kind of contracts a little bit in order to spur the economy. They lower the price of money, which is what this is for banks and businesses to borrow at. So you can see that after every gray line, which is a recession, there's what a decrease in interest rates. Mm -hmm. And um, then after we get out of it, there's usually an increase in interest rates to kind of uh, reset and, 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 you know, be able to fund things the right way and and not get in too much debt. So you can see in general, um, after uh, recessions, interest rates go down. So if we do go into recession next year or 2025 or this year, um, there's a good chance they're going to lower rates. And when they lower rates, real estate prices go up. So just kind of trying to uh, lay a little baseline before we talk about what I think real estate is going to be this year and next year and then in like 15 years. Um, so in general, this makes you see that nothing is crazy scary, right? There's, yeah. there's not a whole lot there. Yeah, and I think like w when you look at the aggregate, right, like in, in your opinion, if you can live from 2000 on and you knew it was going to fluctuate in that ballpark, like you would take that well over <laughs> the, the early, you know, 80s and 90s. Like, that is crazy. Can you imagine paying 20%? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I mean, and people still made money then. I know yeah. it was, it, they had a different different way. So I like to look at this as it's not what it recently was, and it's probably never going to be that way. So let's figure out how to navigate the current environment to create wealth and buy real estate and do what we want to do. You can't, you, you're not going to be successful if you're only successful in a bull market. You can't be successful if you're only successful and there's not a recession. The really good companies, the really good real estate investors, the really good business owners, they figure out how to navigate down times and then they crush it in, 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 in high times when things are really well. So yeah. I, I think that's, I think Hermosi said it, which you just say his name, everybody listens and <laughs> assumes it's fact. He's like, he says it like, um, recessions uh, push people out of business that shouldn't be in business. If you should be in business, know what you're doing. Recessions shouldn't really affect you too much. You maybe won't make as much, but you'll be fine. And couldn't you take advantage of that yeah. recession? Like, to a certain so if you, if you bought a house at, you know, 5% marked up to 7 or 8%, a recession hit, interest rates go down, like you could essentially like refinance, mm -hmm. right? Exactly right. That's what we're going to do. Cause yeah, we got pretty good rates on most of our stuff, but if, and when rates dip, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, we will refinance and try to get uh, take advantage of that lower rate because the values don't really matter if you're looking to sell unless you're looking to sell or refinance unless you're looking to transact my my portfolio that two hundred fifty thousand dollar house I own if it does dip next year and it's worth two hundred thirty five thousand I don't care because in you know twenty years it's going to be worth five hundred and sixty grand regardless of what it does in the short term right. so it, it fluctuates as long as I'm looking to sell it especially for less than I have in it it doesn't matter yeah. You don't sure. lose money in the stock market if you don't sell it when it goes down. Yep. Cool. All right, awesome. So, all right, now the next chart I want to look at, so we've looked at supply demand. We've looked at interest rates. This next one is house median values. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you break this one down a little bit. Matt, so for those that don't know, real estate goes up in value. It does. In the aggregate, death, taxes, and real estate goes up in <laughs> value are the three guarantees in life. Yes. Okay. Yes. So what do you notice when you look at that chart, Matthew? Yeah, there's fluctuations, obviously, uh, down and up. But in the aggregate, again, looking at the big picture, uh, you're, you're trending up. Like, it's a fairly almost linear progression of, of growth. So, uh, again, going back to interest rates in the current market, you know, navigating and pivoting appropriately within strategies. Like, if you can hold on to real estate and you make the right decisions, like, the end goal or the long-term benefit is that property value will increase. Yeah, I know 100%. And another thing, if you're watching or listening, there's these gray lines. These are recessions again. These gray lines are uh, recessions. And um, take out the little COVID blip because real estate shot up afterwards. Um, there are seven of them. Five of the last seven recessions, real estate has gone up in value, which is kind of weird, kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. Um, real estate uh, doesn't uh, go down for long if it's down. The other thing I noticed looking at this chart is at, uh, scanned out oh wait is it sucked it was horrible it, it, the, the finance markets had a big part to play in the stocks um the, the world economy all started with a, the u.s um the u.s housing market but you take a, a zoom back at the, i mean if you bought a house at the height 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 of 2007 by 2000 
13, your house was at the same price. So as long as you could withstand that, uh, you were okay. So the further you look back, it was a big deal. I get that. But like if we just pulled up St. Louis right now, it'd be a 14% dip in those three years. So it wasn't quite as drastic. Yeah. And it, it goes back to evaluating your numbers, making a decision that's based off of your financial criteria, mm-hmm. your situation. And again, like it's a, all a long-term play. So there's going to be ups and downs. Like you got the people that are looking at the stock market daily. They're like, Oh my gosh, like, I can't believe I lost 20 K. You didn't lose 20 K. Like mm-hmm. it's like, look back <laughs> in a month or look back in, in six months. Like there's going to be fluctuations and it's you like, just have to be comfortable with dealing with it's that. Like crypto. Yeah. You're crazy for that. <laughs> so it went up to 69,000 y- yesterday, I think, or the day before the day before yesterday. And I was like, Holy crap. And then, like, I looked, and, of course, it did the whole rug pull thing that we talked about last episode and went back down to, like, 62. It was like, wow, that I just lost, like, 30 grand. And then I looked at 68. It's already back up. So it, it's, yeah, just as long as you don't – as long as they don't sell it, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, I agree. A couple other things on this chart, and then we'll get into some, like, thoughts and predictions of the market or just general thoughts on real estate in general. Um, so – after 2000 uh or after uh 2020 it really shot up right the thing about that it's it's art it's not accurate 100 percent, my opinion it is accurate in like the median house price all the data that the fred um tracks however there were limited transactions so you know the supply was low um people were not moving because of covid partially uh, and because general generally the you know there was bidding wars and there wasn't that many transactions that happened i just told you 2023 was the lowest transactions like in a long time so there hasn't been that many transactions historic like if you're comparing you know apples to apples after 2020 so all of that stuff is on i don't know if i'm going to explain this right you can help me but it's on a few data points so it's not as deep rooted and it's not as accurate if if from 20 15 to 2020 there was 10,000 houses sold that's pretty like that's more substantial from 2020 to 2025 there was 100 houses sold right it's not as indicative of what the actual values are because just because your house doesn't sell doesn't mean it doesn't have a value so not everybody's house went up 150 grand if they didn't sell it it went it went up 150 grand and then they didn't sell it and the numbers and it went down 50 grand it, it didn't go up as much does yeah that, does that make a little sense yeah 100 percent. data tells all right like if you if you go to google right and you, you the see google a, machine you see a restaurant that has you know five stars that's a good way to look but at there's it. three reviews like you're still going to be a little weary right yes but if you go and you see 4.7 so less than five but they have 3,000 reviews. Like, obviously, you have some credibility in that number. So it's a good analogy. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm going to steal that I'm one. here for something. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> uh, right. You're, you're not working right it's now. You're just having fun. It's all food related, too, with me. I like that, yeah. though. That's good for you, Bubs. Um, yeah, so in general, uh, those are the main things I want to point out. It goes up in aggregate. And if, if – and I don't want to do this because it, it would be clunky. But if I picked a time like – Let's say if I if I picked a time, 1982, 15 years later would be 1997, real estate doubled in value. If I picked a time, 1974, 15 years later, 1989, real estate doubled in value. Real estate doubles in value at least every 15 years, or at least doubles in value every 15 years. I think there's three data points on this whole chart that you can see where real estate didn't double in value in 15 years, and it went up, you know, you know, 95% or 94% or 88%, I think are the numbers. So real estate doubles in value over 15 years. Even if you bought a house in 2006 at the height at the time, look at that huge high that was way high for the time. It still doubled in value 15 years later, even after going through the biggest dip ever, which was 08. Mm -hmm. So real estate in aggregate goes up in value. You need, you need to think in 15, 20 year increments. If you're buying rental properties, not in 15, 20 month increments. If you think in 15, 20 month increments, you're going to be like, it's like a day trader. You're, you're going to get caught with your pants down. You're going to get caught, um, you know, trying to outtime the market, but you need to understand it's a long-term game. And if you hold that asset and manage it well and manage it properly, you're going to have an asset that's going to go up in value. The tenant's going to pay the mortgage down. You're going to get tax benefits and you're going to cut cash flow all with a beautiful thing called real estate because the federal government is mandated to require inflation and it's got a little bit of control recently but real estate mirrors inflation and that's why you see those huge ups because basically if you do a roundabout federal government requires inflation real estate mirrors inflation federal government requires real estate to go up it's like 
it's kind of the, the same thing. Sorry, I was validating your numbers. I was picking out 15 year increments and it seems to check out. <laughs> and some of one of them, I think from like uh, look at 70, I think from like 70, 70, like something to 90 something, it went up like uh, it went, it went up three times. It like, it went from like 32 to 92,000 or something insane like that. It, it tripled in that 15 year time frame. Yeah. And it's, and I get, it scares people because the numbers are bigger because of inflation. The, the, the average house price is going to be a million dollars. The average house in the United States is going to be a million dollars in, you know, yeah. I don't know, 20 years, 30 years. It's just going to be the new norm. So those numbers are going to be scary. But if you own real estate, that's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that all makes sense. Yeah, there's a lot of variables, too, as house prices go up, like income and employment. And I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy world. A lot of moving pieces. There are. That's why even with all this technology and everything, it, you can't predict it because there is so many variables. But you can't predict it. doesn't mean we're not going to try. Yep. All right. So what's your prediction for the rest of 2024, Matthew? Yeah, I mean, the election, right? So yep. I'd love to talk to There's you about There's an election this year? There is an election. Let's talk about the points of Trump you like and the points of Biden you like. I'm just kidding. We're <laughs> not doing that. Let's not. Let's not do that. Is that your Trump that, impression? That's it. Can, that's I do, <laughs> can I do my Biden impression? Sure. <laughs> hey, you know what? I hope... It's the right pick for America. That's there you go. I, hope. I, hope no. America I don't know if there is a right pick probably, considering our two choices, but whatever. Not. We're not getting into that. Yeah. All right. Um, 2024. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't see obviously demand, right? Like mm -hmm. demands low. Like I don't see any major fluctuations. Um, obviously, you have uh, some more data points than I no, do. I just want to let you just <laughs> just get you out there on the plane. Yeah, yeah. Let you go. I'm just going to talk I'm, for five minutes. You go. I'm not going to do that. You're going to step in right now. Um, yeah, so my thoughts on the 2024 real estate market, I do think we're getting into a little more normalization period. It was very radical with what the Fed did after COVID going down to zero. That's only happened twice after 08 and after COVID. That's never happened. And then the insane increase to try and curb inflation, that um, that had got, never happened before. So we're talking about historical events here. I feel like those are past a little bit. Um, I, I know crazy stuff happens every election year, and I think that's we're getting into the more normalcy of that. We're going to see you know, increases in the, in the spring and summer, uh, decreases in the fall and winter. It's just going to be more cyclical real estate. We're going to get back into a little more normalcy which while you don't get to collect a, a crazy high swing and you can't take advantage of the lows and buying at discounts and getting low interest rates, it's more predictable, which will, is kind of encouraging. You at least know somewhat what's going to happen around the corner. So that's what I think see happening. I see a normal 3 to 5% appreciation this year. Um, if they do dip rates, the, the, the appreciation is uh, who the hell knows is going to you know, go up another three, four percent because if rates go down, um, it's just going to open the floodgates and people are going to start to buy and transact. And that's going to drive prices up because the supply is still insanely low. As you saw, it's in 08, it was that 4000 units and it's it's 800 units right now. And the average is 2200 units and we're at 800 units. So we're a third of what we should be, what like is considered a market. So we are insanely low in supply. That is the number one driver. That is why everybody on social media has been wrong for the past seven, eight years. And they're going to be wrong for a long time if they're predicting a crash because supply is the number one driver. Yeah, and, and kind of looking at that chart again, right? Looking at the, the full aggregate of that data, like, yes, you know, 3%, you know, rates were amazing mm -hmm. and awesome. Obviously, huge impact with COVID. That was, you know, a factor of that. But don't you want stabilization in your yes. life? Like, would mm -hmm. you rather go back to the crazy swings and fluctuations of 17.5% or whatever, whatever it was on there? Like, I would want stabilization in my life because it means I can be more strategic about how I approach real yes. estate. So you want to be at that you want to be at that 185 190 weight. You don't want to yeah. be 160 to 220 to 175 yeah. to the two, yo yo. You we want it you want it steady. Yeah. Steady Eddie is what I'm going to start calling you. That's perfect. Add another name to the the Rolodex. We're going to have to start I'm going to start writing those down somewhere. <laughs> you should. You should trademark them too. Marty Steve, Marty Dow, Martin Dubs. Generic Ryan Reynolds. Generic Ryan Reynolds. Um, I'll take them all. Chubby Reynolds. <laughs> Chubby Reynolds. <laughs> That's another one. See? I'm not going to fluctuate that. No, I love it. Um, so in general, I think the market's going to be pretty steady. And what I do think that if I buy real estate today... That's worth two hundred fifty thousand is going to be worth five hundred thousand in fifteen years because the data has shown it over and over historically through 08s, through COVIDs, through dot com booms, through whatever you want. Through twenty twenty two, the market getting crushed. Through twenty twenty three, the 
Magnificent Seven, the um, you know the technology firms blowing up the uh, uh, stock market, making it look great. To the recent dips, real estate doubles in value through and through. And if I'm way wrong, it's gonna like the like I would think the worst case scenario in 15 years, it'd be worth 75, 80 percent more than it is now. Yeah, for sure. And especially, you would take that. Well, especially on something that I didn't use any of my own money to buy. There you go. And I don't use any of my own money to maintain. There you go. It's like buying Tesla stock with somebody else's money and you get paid a dividend and you get the growth and you get tax benefits. It's just not, there's no other way around it. So real estate is gonna be a little bit more steady this year with an increase in my opinion. Most markets, some markets a lot, some markets a little, but an increase in most markets. And then I uh, I don't see any, um, his, any like big fluctuation down anytime soon. And in 15 years, it'll be worth double what it's worth now. Love it. Buy it right. Hang on for the long term. Buy it right. Hang on tight. There you go. Yeah, or just, you know, gradual grip. Yeah, gri buy it right, <laughs> casual grip. Yeah. Um, yes. Hang tight means it seems like it's it's a wild ride. Hang tight, just hang loose kind of thing. Um, what's up? Uh, we got we got, we got got X in the house. Let us know X. Where are you at? Where are you from? X. Give us some love there. Right? Yeah. Hey. You said Elon's name and they showed up. I did. Elon, we're going to talk about Elon here in a minute. So that's uh, that's what we got rocking now. Speaking of Elon, speaking of X, let's get into that. All right. So OpenAI shares Elon Musk emails urging startup to raise a billion dollars. See Tesla as a cash cow in the early years. So um, Elon and uh, OpenAI are going through some things right now. Um, there's been some leaked emails. I, I recently read, and I don't know, I can read down there. You can read that while I'm mumbling, so you can fill in the gaps. Once you, um, I probably should have read that before the show started. But um, I know that uh, Elon was talking about or maybe has opened up a suit to sue OpenAI because he was one of the, he was around the very beginning days, and the original um, purpose of the company that was written down legally was not to chase profits, but to cha like l create OpenAI as an open source of AI technology for the world to use so those that have it can't control Control the world and apparently Sam who he looks like such a nice guy but he got kicked out of the board of OpenAI for a little bit Elon's going after him I don't know him that well but some of it makes me think he's trying to be a little greedy and profits with this AI thing which I guess is human nature you see a ton you can become um, worth 200 billion dollars if you kind of hoard this technology and and you know monetize it so I don't I guess that's capitalism um, at its best or worst whatever you want to call it but Elon's not liking what he's doing I don't know if there's strategy behind it with his companies or Tesla or SpaceX or boring company or whatever the hell he's all doing so anyways I, I don't know a ton about that but I want to talk a little about the leaked emails yeah yeah so uh, there were emails that occurred uh, OpenAI showed that Musk previously said um, that they should raise 1 billion and agreed with the co-founder uh, Ilya you want to say that last name? Stodakatova. <laughs> that the company should start being less open over time. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know either on this one. I think, uh, I think I, I don't know why I, I, I tend to side with Elon. I know he's not perfect. I just appreciate his uh, drive, his, in general, I know, like, Tesla, I've heard that he doesn't patent anything because he wants other people to reuse it if they want to. Not that they can't. Like he's, he's. I feel like at this point he's got so much money. Maybe he's the greediest person ever. But in general, I feel like most of the stuff he does is try to further make money, but further humankind with Mars and uh, you know his Starlink stuff, trying to give you know third world countries internet. And in general, I think he's doing things to try to move society forward. Maybe it's through his view that's not everybody's view. But in general, I like everything he does and says, and I'm getting to not like as much I hear from the Sam gentleman, even though uh, uh, Altman, even though he's from St. Louis. Shout out John Burroughs. I think that's where he went <laughs> um, for middle or for high school. But in general, um, I was side with Elon on this one, I guess. And, and a couple of notes here. Uh, no one can confirm the authenticity of the emails. They're written a long time ago. And an email versus a corporate legal document. The corporate legal document needs to take precedent. And he's saying they need to live by the corporate legal document. And they're saying, oh, but you wrote this email that said this. It's like, come on, how much email, how much dumb shit have we said in emails? It's like you can't. Sounds like a gal at the White House. Ooh, who? <laughs> no comment. Um, yeah, I mean, and also like media, like Elon's in every media story out there and he seems to prevail like more times than not. So like, like what's open AI's angle at this too? Like, is there a, a benefit, um, I don't know, to fund money or, or do something like 
to, to gain, more, gain more transparency within the market and, and try to do something else. I don't know. Is there a financial gain? For I think there AI? is. When Sam Altman got kicked out of the board monetarily or briefly, apparently it was because he well, was going around the board raising money trying to like make OpenAI super profitable, which, again, the good and bad of capitalism. But they're like, no, we need to control this. We need to make this more so a lot of things he's doing and saying um, are for profit, which I guess, I mean, again, you can't hold anything against them, but uh, they have the technology. They have a head start. You know, most people, Bezos had a head start on Amazon stuff and he didn't give it to the world. So I guess I'm trying to see both sides of it. But when we're talking AI, we're talking human like, uh, you know, human uh, fulfillment. I think that um, him being worth several billion instead of several hundred billion or whatever it would be is probably okay. I, I go back to the last time I'm going to say this episode, go back to Hermosi saying he doesn't want to move to Puerto Rico and live there six months out of the year to save money on taxes. He's like, when I'm dead, I'll be in, if I, you know, move to Puerto Rico, I'll have 800 billion. Or if I don't, I'll have, uh, you know, 500 billion. Yeah. I'm okay with 500 yeah. billion kind of mindset is kind of what I'm looking at it. From. Yeah. And talking about just AI in general, like making <laughs> these, aggressive decisions i feel like this is a, a spot where we need to be a little more cognizant of the the ramifications that could come from you know some of these things for sure all right Foot Locker shares plunge more than 20 percent as retailer post holiday loss yikes yeah Foot Locker used to be the thing to go to the it's day I, I used to get one pair of tennis shoes a year so the weekend before school would start me and my mom would go there we'd I'd go try on all the shoes, the different cool, the Air Maxes, all the stuff everybody else was doing. Now, we would get nice shoes, but we wouldn't get, like, that nice of stuff. And she would always have to, like, not tell my dad how much the shoes cost. If we bought, like, $80 shoes. We'd, you went like, to Foot Locker, we would, though. I went to Pay Less, dog. <laughs> well, well, I went to Foot Locker because I'm a big deal. But we would buy the cheap stuff or whatever's on clearance. But it was usually, like, 80 or 90 bucks, and we'd tell my dad it was, like, 50 bucks. Did you think they were real, they were real referees? I did. I, yeah. I did. I was, like, penalty. I You're like, foul. Is that, a, oh, that is a foul call. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I mean, brick and mortar. I think mm -hmm. it's dying. <laughs> yeah, Amazon. It's, it's crazy to say. I mean, I think, I think you think like uh, sp specifically the shoe industry. One, you have all these like um, boutique shoes, uh, shoe companies, uh, even if they're brick and mortar, but like people are going to more boutique locations for high end shoes. I feel like if they're not high end shoes, you can source them from the web whether it's amazon whether it's nike whether it's you timu know, timu <laughs> but yeah i mean i feel like i mean look at all of you know the the major mainstream malls that were the biggest thing ever in the 90s when we were growing up i remember going to the mall on friday night and it was buzzing i was there you, you were know, one of those twenty dollars in my you? twenty dollars in my pocket to buy you know uh you know a couple tacos at taco bell and uh maybe peruse a movie but you better uh, not bought drugs with that money there's no drugs bought Good. <laughs> but yeah i mean dip. the brick, brick i would see you buying dip when you're <laughs> yeah a little bit of tobacco yeah no but anyway brick and mortars <laughs> brick and mortars dying yes and i mean it's it's sad but it's the you know way of the future and the way things are pivoted and it and ultimately it's the way that consumers want to be dealt with mm -hmm. so if consumers want to be dealt with in a certain way obviously you're going to see uh ramifications again uh in what worked in the 90s is not going to work in you know 2020 and beyond so that's my take on it i agree no i i agree i think it's just uh it, it's just a uh, kind of a metaphor for older school brick and mortar style i know you can um Foot Locker has an uh, online, but I, I remember it's a few years ago, like looking for Jordans or I like going there. It's not very, um, you know, user friendly. It's just not what it is to, to, you know, go and buy phone, go buy shoes off an app and shoes are made better these days. So you don't have to go get your foot like measured every time. And you, you made a great point earlier. I feel like, uh, you know, there's so many boutique shoes, but like everybody has shoes now because technology and, you know, fact, and like you can make shoes super cheap before there's only a few, you know, Reebok and Adidas and Nike and New Balance. That was it. Yep. Now there's, I mean, built, I'm a big built guy, right? I mean, they have shoes, like everybody has shoes because you can source them and make them super, super uh, inexpensively. And they can, they're just like expanding their product line, all these companies and all these uh, clothing companies to like have shoes as like, even if it's a loss leader or they don't make huge profits, just part of the whole get up. Yeah. You ready for my hot take? Let's go. Customer service sucks. Not specifically Foot Locker, but in general, like he's called. He's calling you out, Foot Locker. <laughs> I mean, customer service needs to be like 
first and foremost in every business, in my opinion, like take care of the customer, um, you know, and the profits will follow. But like you go to a Foot Locker, like I've never, uh, and this is just an example, but like there's so many disinterested employees of these companies that you're like, why would I want to deal with that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, why would I want to go there and be like, less important than their phone or whatever they're doing or you know messing around at work so i feel like customer service like whether you think of it or not like plays a huge factor in people being like i can just do this online well because people want to be treated well just go to the analogy further in the fast food jack in the box has the worst customer service i've ever seen is the, the store in Wentzville is closed half the time because they can't even staff it i feel like taco bell you're like got all like younger and but then you go to like chick-fil-a and they're, they're happy and they're nice and there's but they're they're young so it's nothing to do with the age of the people it has to do with like the culture and how yeah. they're trained but at, at chick-fil-a they treat you like people go there just because the, i mean honestly that the go there so much the chickens kind of like whatever but it's just because you're, you're the kids love it they're happy and it's clean and it's nice and they're they're convenient and they work well it's all about customer service consistency so just, and quality yep, like 100%. you get that every time Awesome. All right. So let's talk about the Forbes highest list paid actors in 2023. Right. I got the list. You don't. Are those them? Yeah, those are some of them. <laughs> they did a good job with that. Somebody yeah. put some time into that. All right. So who do you think the number one paid actor or actress was in 2023? So I just saw her in SNL. She's been in like, I don't know, three or four movies this year. She was in White Lotus. Okay. Sydney Sweeney, a little bit of a heartthrob for the the gentleman out there. But oh, you have a thing for her. Sydney that. Sweeney. She's not on the list. Of She's top not 10. on the list. Okay. Look on the screen. There's some. Well, hints. I'm not gonna cheat. Well, who the number one is? Uh, is it, you want to know who my favorite is? Denzel, but uh, Ben Affleck, Adam Sandler. Really. I think he's got an incredible deal with Netflix. Ah, that I think makes Leo sense. came out, and then his other uh, Uncut Gems. I'm sure he gets more money from that or whatever. So, or no, it's not Uncut Gems. It's um, or is that right? Uh, Adam Sandler was it? Uncut yeah, Uncut Gems. Gems. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So my thought with with uh, Ben Affleck, like, pay highest paid actor. He's like, nine. But really, mm -hmm. thirty eight million. I figured he's doing a ton of stuff with like being a producer, but also acting. So like little double dipping action there. I mean, top of, 10. A lot of passion projects out there, but he's an incredible actor. You got uh, Ryan Gosling, a little Barbie movie. I'm going to assume that his his counterpart, Margot Robbie, is on there. Is she number on there? Dose. She's number, number two. two, which is all 59 million. Okay. But still, it's a gap between old Adam. How is Jason Statham on there? That's uh, my question. Because he just gets overpaid for those horrible, you know, movies that he's probably not doesn't even do half the stuff on because of his transporter got, 17 yeah because he's got uh because <laughs> he's got uh you know stunt men um let's just go through them real quick okay. um so adam sandler's number one margaret robbie's number two tom tommy cruz number three ryan gosling number four uh tied with old my, my boy my favorite one on there is maddie damon uh 43 million they're both tied number four jennifer aniston what is i guess she's she's probably in a couple she's in, been in a couple movies with sandler so yeah apparently you get, get in a sandler movie you get paid uh she's six leo probably my second favorite on there is um number seven which is insane think to, to think no offense jason statham you could beat me up think him and jason statham made the same amount of money is 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 silly he was one of the best actors ever so do you think there's residuals built into this number probably yeah, i would guess that would make a lot more sense benny affleck nine and then denzel 10 who's denzel's just probably the best one up there he's a goat he is the goat what, all right two questions yep F matt damon favorite actor what's your favorite matt damon movie <sighs> There's so many that I really like. It's pretty simple. Probably There's, Rounders. Yes, that Rounders is the best is, one. Rounders is good. I love him in all the stuff. Rounders is so good. He's really good in, in the Jason Bourne movies. He does a really good job playing. It's a little bit different of like a fighting uh, like a hero movie or whatever. Um, and I like his uh, all his pretty much all the stuff he does. I, I watched Oceans. I was watching Oceans 11 last night. Yeah. He's great in that. He um, is. And I mean, Good Will Hunting might be my favorite like top yeah. five movie ever. So. It's I classic. probably like Goodwill Hunting better than Rounders, but I like Mar I like Maddie in both. But uh, I feel like Rounders is like the most unheard of Matt Damon flick that like everybody so should watch. Yeah, it's it's very very yeah. good, and it was right on that Texas Hold'em. Yeah, carried that wave up. That they was smart. got it. They, they got it. They got it. Good timing, Maddie. Cool. Isn't it saying that Matt Damon and Ben Affleck started hanging out when they were eight years old, and they're both like probably on the top ten actors list for probably for the last twenty years, or probably on it more than not. Your association. There you go. It's all about environment, not location. Oh, hit him with it. Rap song? I could, I've done a, I've got a rap song out okay. there. 
It's on the interwebs. You can find it. Okay. The Burr's Rap, I think is what it's called. The, the Freedom Rap, maybe. Um, okay, cool. That's our headlines. Let's get into Riddle Me This. This is where I make Matt look silly. You ready for it? I'm ready. Let's go. All right, Matthew. What creature is smarter than a talking parrot? What creature is smarter than a talking parrot? So talking parrots, I feel like in order to be a talking parrot, like you have to have some uh, influence from another creature. And I'm going to assume, like you're kind of a creature, right? Like oh. creature of habit. Mm-hmm. No. Is it human? Um, see, so this one's tricky. It, it's a, a, it's like their joke. So what's, what oh. creature is smarter than talking parrot? A spelling bee. That's very funny. Have you watched Bee Movie? Jerry Seinfeld. I watched a little bit of it. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. Faster, get it? Like faster freedom spelling bee. All right, See that it. was ticket. This one is not as bad. All right, ready? Second one. What rock group consists of four famous men, but none of them sing? Rock group, four famous men can't sing. Mount Rushmore. Yep. Is that it? Yep. You got it. That's good. See, you got to look past it. Like Who would got... be on your Mount Rushmore? Of what? I don't know. Let's talk about actors or actresses. Um, Mount Rushmore of actors, actresses, um, which I don't even know. I think a lot of them is just actor. Like uh, like Margot Robbie says she's an actor. I think it's just like a term that yeah. they're trying to like not have be sex either way. It's just an actor is somebody that acts, not okay. a male or a female. Um Although I think the awards are best leading actor or the best leading actress. But anyways, I don't know. I'm confused about that if you can't tell. I would I would put um, Denzel up there. I would put um, uh, Leo. I would put... I think you got to put... Um, what's her face? Meryl Streep up there. And then I'm going to just put Maddie Damon because I love him. Love it. What about you? I would go Denzel. Okay. One of one. You're a big, you're a big Denzel <laughs> guy big here. Denzel. Man on Fire is my favorite movie. So Denzel, one of one. Um, Christoph Waltz. Okay, you know yes, he's is? a very good he's actor. Very yes. good. He's in, um, he's in. Uh, he's in Django. He's in a lot of things. He's in uh, what's the one I'm thinking of? Uh, Inglorious Bastards. Yes. I think. Yeah, he's he's pretty funny in that. Yes, I would go. I would go Leo as well. And look at Louis on here. Let's go. Uh, Last but not least, rounded it out. Let's go. Let's go, Margot. I think she's incredible. She is incredible. What uh, you do you like uh, her in? Uh, I like Barbie movie. Not uh, <laughs> no, nope. not Wolf of Wall Street. Nope. No sir. Mm-hmm. Never mm-hmm. watched it before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, she's a very talented uh, actor, actress. I don't know which one it is, but very talented. Um, she, like I didn't even know for the longest time she was like had an accent. Yeah, because she's like speaks so well, like like the English side of it, then she's got like the, I that is incredible. Australian, that. right? Is what she is. Yeah. yeah like uh, yes. New Zealand, Australian, same yeah. thing, right? That might be the most incredible thing. The fact that like there are actors, you know, non mm-hmm. plural, um, that they have a completely different, like, <laughs> do you watch in between two ferns? I've seen at all with Zach Galifianakis. Yeah. So one of his lines is my favorite one ever to Benedict Cumberland or whatever. Have you seen that one? Cumberbatch. Yeah, Cumberbatch. He's he goes uh, and they like laugh like that like the cut ups. But he goes, um, do you think that there? Uh, or he said, do you think the reason you have an accent is the reason why nobody can tell you're a shitty actor? <laughs> Which is <laughs> really true. Funny. I feel like it could disguise. Yeah, some it could. Success. It could. It could. Lou Louie wants me to do an accent. Um, which accent? Australian? Yeah, do it. Give me his phrase to say. Um, how about another one? You got to give me more words than that so I can get into it. Give me a whole sentence to say. Um, can you go to the fridge and grab another beer? All right. Australian. Trip on the Bobby. Can you go to the fridge and grab another beer? That's not it. Was that good? I did I that just for you, it. Lucas. That's me being vulnerable. That is true. You're a great You don't make fun of me for being vulnerable. <laughs> no, I won't. Level six. All right, last one. Mr. Blue lives in a blue house. Mr. Yellow lives in a yellow house. Mr. Black lives in a black house. Who lives in the white house? I mean, I I feel like this is like, I'm I'm gonna have to guess this, you're probably gonna tell me I'm wrong, but is it the president? That is correct. You got it right, what do you mean? uh, Lucas would have gone went over three. You went two for three. Luke, he's 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 bringing you down if you're no, watching anymore. He's bringing you. It's a team you. effort. Mm-hmm. Luke's with me in spirit right now. 
And the first one is like impossible, so I give you 100%. Thank you. I'll take it. All right. True, false me, bro. All right. Nintendo was founded in 18... 18- 89. So I do know Nintendo would found, was founded a long time ago. This is where true false is tricky because most people <clears throat> think Nintendo was founded in like the 1990s or something. I know it was founded like at least in like 1900 or, or late 18, 1800s. Um, Join the program today from, oh, okay, from Nigeria. Nice. We got, hi, Remy. Hi, Remy. Okay. Hope, uh, we got somebody from there then. That'll be hard to teach them. All right. Okay. So I'm going to say true. I know it was a long time ago. Again, I could be off by like five years or something. I'm going to say true. Yes, true. Nintendo was founded as Nintendo Kopai on 23rd of September, Jen's birthday, like 200 years ago, uh, 1889 by craftsman Fusajiro Yamauchi. How about that for pronouncing that correctly? Perfect. The great accent. All right. Uh, so one for one. You want to know what they produce first, though? Well, I would love to know, Matthew. Playing cards. Playing cards. Nice. I like it. Yeah. I like it. All right. You Lucas can... said the side laugh, the side laugh emoji. We, are, <laughs> we have a conversation that the, the straight up one down one is used much more. Yeah. Um, all right. Number two, you can fit all the planets in our solar system side by side in between Earth and the moon. Ah, this is tricky because the moon doesn't seem that far away. It is, though, is the thing. Um I don't know. Like, the Earth isn't really that big. Saturn, Jupiter are freaking ginormous. Big dogs. Um, Yeah, just the, the size and scale of, like, our solar system and then the universe is just mind-boggling, I think. There's more stars than there are grains of sand on the Earth, which is insane to think about, and each star has planets around. So, yeah, so the scale of it, I don't know. This one's tricky. You'd think... Like duh, no, because the Earth, the Moon, and Earth are somewhat close when you take when you take a full scale back. But it takes like, I think like four days to fly to the Moon. So does it really take? If you're going really fast, is it going to take four full days to fly just past all the planets? So I'm going to say false. It's Ooh. true. Oh, he wrote true though. I'll take it. True. See, that's why true false is hard. Luke acts like it's so easy. They touch it. <laughs> Do you feel like the gas planets, like you can just jam them in? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So they're saying that you can fit them in between? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. You're, you're, one, you're one of Whatever. two. Whatever. Fuck this. <laughs> uh, all right. Last but not least, there are more ways to shuffle a deck of cards than there are atoms on Earth. I mean, I know there's probably – so a shuffling deck of cards is, is like an insane thing. I think. Um, I think I read something that like – can't you just like take the top card and put it in the middle and be like, "That's a new way." Well, I, well, like the uh, w- yeah. So there's so many ways you can do. Yeah. It. I think something there's never been the same set of cards ever shuffled or something insane like that. So it seems insane, but I'm gonna say true. You were right. It is true. Two for three. Suck at walls. That's not very nice. That wasn't very nice. Sorry. <laughs> awesome. Well, congratulations. Two for we'll three call it each. a tie. That's outside of the win-win. We're I'll give you the win. Tiebreaker. The tie goes to the runner. You're shot, the guest. Tiebreaker yes. on the shot. Yes. Okay. Cool. Well, two tiebreaker on the shot. I love that. So true or false? Good. We we both did good on those. Two for three. I love it. All right. We are on to the deal of the week. This deal has been um, teased a little bit in past episodes. We had a guest, Mr. Andrew Robert Bird, over there. He's the one that's got this under contract. He talked about it a little bit. But this is a deal we're working on right now. Um, this is a uh, this is deal of the week. This is a seven pack of houses we bought on one street. We'll go ahead and pull up pull up the street view. So I'm, while I'm pulling up the the uh, talk about the story, so this was um, a pack of houses that was brought to us by one of um, somebody that we bought houses before, a local wholesaler, and he has had contacts with a builder. A builder bought these houses with plans. You can see them right there. There's some developments going around. So it's seven of those 14 houses. So half the street. Um, they were doing some developments around here, and a builder like a commercial development builder bought these houses with plans to tear them down and I think put in like uh, some type of uh, building like I think Costco and a few different um, like big companies like that were going to put in you know some some buildings out there and they backed out so then this builder's like I'm backing out then I'm not going to build whatever they're going to build maybe like a shopping center or like a commercial little development if they're Costco and those people are leaving so you can see as he's scrolling around yet yeah, just keep doing that's good you can go up and down the street um so as you can see these are just normal you know nice 
three one three two uh, brick houses outdated they've been vacant for a while because the builder bought them all and um is exiting and the issue with this one is there's the city's involved so they're they have to be done like the right way you can't just sell them to anybody well if they needed to sell them somebody that they trusted yeah. they could close because we got all sell them under contract for 1.33 million dollars so um, a little less than two hundred thousand dollars per house and they need anywhere from 50 to 100 grand each so they do need work and as we scroll up and down we can pull up some pictures of one of the house just to get a feel for it. but it's a nice little street actually yeah i love so the it's gonna, tree line it's going to be great uh Going great to have houses here and sell them. Um, so we got them under contract. Um, we were one of the. There's some. You can see the address and there's some houses you can see pulled up if you're if you're watching. Uh, you can see them if you're listening. After the fact, they're just. I mean, when you think of a St. Louis 1950s build, 1960s build, three two, you know, brick ranch. That's what you're getting. They're nice, beautiful little houses in in a good area of town. Um, you know, not ginormous by any means. So we got them under contract because we were the only one that we were shop to. The builder was okay with he had to come to the office he was okay with selling to us or the developer i guess is the better word for it probably and he came to the office and um you know the person who's wholesaling us the deal is making a little bit of money but as you can see this one doesn't need a ton of work but um you know we bought it for you know 200 grand um so we bought and paid a good price for him but they do need works look at that tv go back look at that tv mm -hmm. inside that wall that is like something from the office or something that's <laughs> fancy dwight Schrute. dwight Schrute, or the the one with um Michael Scott when he has his TV his flat screen <laughs> yeah. TV then he like turns it on that's so funny when he has Jim and Pam over that's funny so anyways it's not a flat screen but they put it in the wall so it looked yeah. like a flat screen that is hilarious um, so in general yeah the great houses maybe they inside them looks like more like 60 or 70s bill but regardless they're you know 40 50 years old and uh, we bought them for 1.33 million dollars um, and the plan is we're gonna put about 600 grand into them yeah so uh, so you have an ARV number so is there a comp in on the street there is a comp on the street i believe and then there's some comps around it but we'll set the comp so it's a little yeah. bit that's a little bit of risk a part of this deal is because um the risky part of this deal is because it's um you know something that like there's not like a ton of hard comps but it's a great area of town we you know they're, they're nice clean solid houses the the bones are good we just need to kind of button them up and make them look nice and sell them so it, um a couple of things i want to talk about this deal let's go over the numbers then i want to break down a few things so bought for 1.33 putting about 600 grand into it so let's say holding costs to say we go over we're all in them for about two million bucks um we think and they're worth 2.5 so that's you know we got realtor fees and each time we sell them so it's it's going to be a good deal it has potential if we go over a little bit to be a great deal either way it should be a solid you know a solid you know 56 grand per house be able to do them all at one time send out if they need roofs roof can go out and knock out three of the five seven houses that need roofs whatever it is painter can go just you know um button everything up and just spray 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 the houses so we can get efficient with it all being in one area yeah. all in one spot so there's some benefits to it but it's a big number having two million dollars in this and if they sell for two 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 three holding cost fee that's not going to be worth it it's not it's not worth risking two million dollars to make you know you know to make 150 grand 100 right. grand. so hopefully i think it'll be more than that but there is some risk involved we didn't like get a steal on them but we got a good solid deal on some good solid houses they're in a good end price point end price range we're talking you know what is that seven times three we're talking three hundred fifty thousand dollar houses in st louis in a good area so we should be we, i think it'll be a really good deal but there is some risk involved it's not like a slam dunk deal but it, it could turn into one yeah and think about the impact like you're essentially like creating a development mm -hmm. off of something that's existing already so you're you're walking into a, a a street that has 14 or 15 houses i can't remember what you said but you're buying 50 percent of them mm -hmm. so you're going to reset kind of the market you're gonna probably inspire some people in mm -hmm. that street to be like holy cow, my house could look like that. Not that those look terrible, but like there's improvements that can be made. But like if you guys come in, do it the right way, you might buy one of those houses. We might. You might You might have someone be like, hey, like I'm ready to get out of here for X reason. Like are you guys interested? Like it could be the, the avenue to another house. And yeah, you guys are going to set the market, which is super cool. I like this reminds me of the 42-pack of houses that we bought. We bought half of a neighborhood. Not as nice of an area. Wentzville is great, but the area Wentzville we bought these in weren't as good, and they, they we screwed that one up really bad. 
we bought them for 42,000. Uh, we bought 42 houses and we um, thought that they were going to need $500,000 in work and they need $1.5 million in work. So we had to raise another million bucks. So we learned our lesson on this one. We're raising all the money the right way. Um, not, you know, not as big of numbers, not as big of, uh, you know, bigger rehab, but we're not going to have to go back and screw up. So we did learn our lesson. We made, we broke that deal down before we may break that down again, again, that 42 pack when we refinance here in the next couple months. But in general, um, couple things I want to bring out is you made a great point. We're making the area better. We're improving every house in that street's going to be worth more and we're done a little bit of risk involved, but it's calculated risk, you know, you know, done on solid houses. And the other thing is a lot of deals like this, the 42 pack of houses, this deal, like everybody's like, I want a seven pack of deal. I want for Like they want that, but this all took time five years ago. We would not have been able to do this deal. We didn't have the funding, didn't have the relationships, didn't have the credibility to do it. And the guy, Mike, we bought these from, we've sold houses to and bought houses from for years. So yeah. these are type of things that everybody wants to see that carrot at the end. Everybody wants to see, they want to buy a 32 unit, their first deal. They want to do something like this. This kind of stuff takes time. Everybody can get to it, but you know, five years ago in what was that? 2019, I owned 60 doors, 60 rental properties. Yeah. That's a lot, right? Yeah. I couldn't have done this deal. So it just, this kind of stuff takes time. So people need to stop trying to, which is kind of what we're getting to here in a minute, the motivation people need to, in my opinion, again, I hate absolute. They need to stop like trying to see the light at the end of the tunnel with all the, the, you know, the, or the, I guess better analogy would be, you know, at the end of the rainbow, the pot of gold, like you got to get to there first. You can't just skip to that you have to go through a lot of crap and go through the journey to get there yeah they want to they want to get to the destination and not take the trip like but the trip like what the trip uh entails it's building relationships proving the process uh finding quality funding and quality contractor sources i mean um you would have never gotten this deal shopped to you by somebody who trusts you because you have this body of work if it wasn't for the first 60 single family homes and the impact in the community and all that stuff. So um, yeah, definitely a, a, a process and you're, you're taking steps to like an ultimate goal, right? Mm -hmm. And there's two words. I'm ready for them. Delayed <laughs> gratification. Yeah. That's a big thing we talk about a lot in our program, a lot in our community, uh, a lot with the people that we're able to work with on a one-on-one -on -one basis is having that delayed gratification everybody wants it now everybody wants it yesterday everybody wants it bigger better they want it now because of TikTok and the technology and you're able to get things so quickly but the bigger stuff you still have to take your time on you still have to be willing to have that delayed gratification you still have to be willing to put in a shit ton of effort for a minimal amount of results at first and then things compound they expand they 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 end up adding up to something big snowball but you, effect snowball effect yeah remy's getting value i like it i Let's like go. it program late today from Redmond year we got an okay we'll yeah. talk about that um cool i like it all right awesome so that's our that's our deal of the week now we're going to get into motivation wins and then we're going to do the tiebreaker on the jump shot we have to jump yes oh this time you have to jump and do it okay <laughs> i do so i was ahead of lucas by one on the shooting thing and i last time was all excited and probably jacked up on celsius i, I shot with my eyes closed like michael and i missed so now we're tied why do you say michael Michael Jordan? Why don't you say LeBron? Because Michael don't Jordan shot a shot with his eyes closed. Sour his name. Come on. We don't even want to get into that. How much time we got? You can't even compare Michael Jordan and LeBron James anymore. It's not even a comparison. In LeBron's 21st year, he has scored more points than every person in NBA history combined in their 21st it's, year. It's a puppy game today, though. There, there's no physicality. Nobody, nobody thinks that today this today has this never been harder to play basketball in the NBA than today. Why? When Mike, because there's no the top the last five MVPs have been all international players there was no international player. It was united states sports and now it's a worldwide sports back in the day would have been no luca would have been no joker they wouldn't have played because it was an international game nobody thinks that it's harder to play back then than now maybe it was more physical but it wasn't a harder game football is more physical back then you really think back when they had leather helmets that they could beat the players today no they couldn't it's more physical so we got to do an episode on that i do some shorts on that because with what lebron has done this year the jordan lebron debate it's <clears throat> over it's not even a debate anymore wrong there's no there okay michael jordan couldn't even 
Michael Jordan couldn't even get the, the Wizards to the playoffs in his 15th year. LeBron's going to get the Lakers to the playoffs in his 21st year. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> moving right. on. Continue. Gets me fired up. I don't even like LeBron's off-court stuff very much and his, and his flopping and all that bullshit. That doesn't mean he's not better. All right. Let's get into some quote. Motivation Wednesday. Because it's Wednesday. Keep your eyes on the stars and your feet on the ground from my man Teddy Roosevelt. What do you think about that? I love it. I think, yeah, interpretation, keep your eyes on the stars, like always be looking forward, always be looking towards that end destination, right? But going back to, hey, I want to buy a seven pack of houses. Hey, I want to buy an apartment building, but I have zero experience in real estate. So time this back to real estate, like you got to you got to put the work work boots on, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have to get to work. You have to take action. It doesn't just get handed to you like you see that shiny star out there, but like you, you got to get to step in. So. Yeah, no, I, so there's different ways to, to, to look at it. You're looking at it as dream big, but keep moving your feet. Like, I look at it as have big aspirations, but stay grounded. Like, yeah, you, yeah which is, there's not right or wrong, right? We're, we're just, and there's different ways to look at it. But, like, I think this is kind of saying, like, you have to be grounded. You have to be here. You have to be present. But, you know, always be looking for more. Always be looking up. Always be wanting more. And this is, I think, this is an interesting way to put it. This is something that I... I don't say struggle with. I've gotten better with it and more understanding about it. But it's one of those things where, um, like, it's like you're satisfied, but you want more. You're like you're 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 content but unsatisfied. I don't know how to describe it, but like wanting more. I own a decent amount of real estate. I want to own more decent companies. I want them to do better. So I'm happy with where things are, but I'm very driven to do more. And I I guess maybe because that's who I am. I'm like forcing that into this analogy but that's kind of how i look at a little bit yeah i think the grounded or keep your feet on the ground like you you have to stay present right to Mm -hmm. to succeed and and get to that you know star destination like you have to be present you have to take action in your day-to-day or yearly or or five-year plan but like you're not looking backwards you're not looking in a rearview mirror like you're looking you're, you're remaining that focus on like hey this is the ultimate goal for me and this is what that looks like but you're present to accomplish that and it takes you know steps one percent better every day uh you know you do the little things with single family homes you get those connections with a seven pack of houses or an apartment building or whatever that looks like so if your goal is real estate like taking those steps and and gradually growing every day is super important so feet on the ground keep moving but also you know have an audacious goal out there like it'd be silly for you to underachieve because your goal was so low Mm -hmm. shoot for the moon or no shoot for the stars laying on the cloud or shoot for the moon what's that kanye line is it shoot for the Mm. moon laying on the laying on the clouds or shoot for the stars laying on the clouds moon sounds like a a picture with you know a little motto that you bought from target the yes i do love me some target target stock did well for us the uh (laughs) i had a banger day yesterday old philly sent us that so cool all right thank you matt you did a great job thank you i'm proud of you appreciate it you 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 can you can show up to work tomorrow all right <laughs> all let's right. crumble up the outline and shoot it you're not lucas five to five you gotta jump though remember ready oh. i made it short you gotta not end short you can't look all right ready gotta jump <laughs> Thanks for listening to today's episode. We hope you got some major value from our conversation. If you love what you learn, make sure you like, rate, review the show, and help us spread the word by telling a friend. If you'd like to learn more about working with me inside one of my programs, we'll have those links in the show notes, along with all our social media handles, so you connect with us there for free. If there's a real estate question you'd like us to answer, feel free to send us a message, and we'll cover it in an upcoming show.